Well, Paul, thank you very much indeed for reading for us. May I encourage you to keep that uh, Bible reading open on page uh, 1104. May I add my warm welcome to you, especially if this is a first visit amongst us here on a Tuesday. I hope it will be the first of many and you'll be able to join us regularly. Our subject is the missionary expansion of the church. What does authentic missionary expansion look like? I want us to hold up a plumb line against that idea and our thoughts on that idea and ask ourselves whether what we think about it matches what we find here in Acts chapter 8. We're going to see that God is behind it. You'll never be able to stop it, the missionary expansion of the church, that Jesus is at the heart of it. This is how you can assess it, is the death and resurrection of Jesus right there in the center. And then the explanation of God's word is essential to it. We have a part to play. So first, it's God's work. God is behind it. And I want us to see this both on macro and on micro level. On the macro level, it is the theme of the whole of the Bible, that God is in the business of drawing together a people who belong to him from across the globe. What I did was to jot down one or two key texts here on the back of the notice sheet for you under the first point, God is behind it. God promises Abraham... Uh, this fact that he will be the father of a multitude of nations. The prophet Isaiah announces, noticeably to eunuchs, I will give in my house a name better than sons and daughters, an everlasting name that shall be, not be cut off. And Luke's gospel begins with a promise from Simeon in the temple that uh, one has been born as he holds the baby Jesus in his arms, a light for revelation to the nations. So you can see it on the macro level as God promises it. And Jesus announces it, Luke 24, that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in Christ's name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And then at the beginning of this book, the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit enables it. You will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And here we find ourselves in a section of uh, Luke's uh, book of Acts in between the gospel in Jerusalem and then it beginning to burst out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And uh, God is behind it. He promised it. Uh, Jesus announced it. The Holy Spirit enables it. Indeed, even in this chapter, if you look at the way the chapter begins in verse 1, with extreme persecution, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church. And verse 4, those who were scattered, the church being scattered through that persecution. Even as the disciples were driven out and away from one of the most successful missionary events in the history of the church, the growth of the early church, in Jerusalem shortly after the death and resurrection of Jesus, growing from a group of 120 to thousands and thousands in a matter of weeks. Even as they're driven away from the center of one of the most successful Christian missions in the history of the church, they go out preaching the word and the missionary advance takes place. Interestingly, the key evangelists are left in Jerusalem. And even with the apostles left in Jerusalem, nonetheless the word goes out and the church advances and this triggers the worldwide expansion of the gospel. However, it's not only on the macro level that we witness God's hand over the advance of his gospel across the world. Just glance at the micro level now at our incident, verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. There is a de this is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. 
So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? Who brought Philip down to the desert road heading south? God did. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, who spoke to Philip and told him to go up to Ethiopian's chariot? God did. Verse 29, the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Who arranged this quite remarkable coincidence that at the very moment Philip approached the chariot, our friend, the Ethiopian Chancellor of the Exchequer, should be reading from Isaiah 53. God did. And who is it that has so worked in the heart of the Ethiopian that he should be wanting to hear the good news of the gospel at the very moment that Philip comes alongside his, cha his chariot? God did. Are we not then meant to conclude that God is in charge as Philip, led by the Holy Spirit, finds himself at the right place, at the right time, at the right point in this mighty man's life. Here is Queen Candace's Chancellor of the Exchequer. The first century Ethiopia covered much of the modern Sudan. It was the Old Testament land of Cush. He was obviously either a Jew himself or more likely a Jewish convert, and he'd been in Jerusalem worshipping at a Jewish religious festival. High-ranking, religious African, on his way back to number 11. He's travelling in his ministerial limousine and laid out on the expansive leather upholstery of the ministerial papers, his laptop and his iPhone. Chariot was most likely powered by bullocks and therefore I think we'll give him the name George Oxbourne. He spent much of the morning plotting how he might demonstrate conclusively to the electorate that the current financial hardship was entirely the result of mismanagement by his predecessors. But now he's put all of these thoughts on hold and his mind has turned to something that has been troubling him since his trip up to Jerusalem because when he was at the temple, he'd been to the temple bookstall and they were running a special deal and 15 of those dot com had the scroll of Isaiah on special offer. Being a man of wealth, he purchased it and he was reading out loud from Isaiah as was the custom. He just got to the bit where God explains how it is that the nations, even eunuchs from foreign nations like Cush, would be brought into God's rich blessing by the death of his servant and his servant's suffering. And at that very moment, Philip approaches his chariot. Is it not remarkable then that the Ethiopian Chancellor should be reading from this passage at this point in this place? And are we not meant to be in, conclude that God himself is in absolute control of the unstoppable advance of his good news? On the macro scale he promised it, on the micro scale he is absolutely committed to it. Those of us who are convinced of the purpose of God to advance his gospel across the globe can on occasion, I suspect, fall into the trap of thinking this advance will only happen if we, the evangelists, make all the running. And there can be, I think even in a place like this Tuesday lunchtime work, a sort of fevered frenetic activity on our part as if the whole thing depends upon me. You can't get that impression here. God makes the running. God produces the hungry heart in the Sudanese, in the Ethiopian Chancellor. God arranges for Philip to be in the right place at the right time. God is committed. It's God's work. And you'll never be able to stop it. I remember a number of years ago, I was seeking to uh, make the truth of Jesus known to a friend of mine, a friend here in the city. And I just had rather a disappointing session with him where it felt like, I was uh, trying to penetrate a stone wall. And I went uh, rather despondently up to the office and there was my predecessor, Dick Lucas, sitting there and he said, oh, you're looking a bit glum. What's the issue? And I said, and he said, is he hungry? And I said, I don't think he is. And then Dick made as if to say, well, is there any hunger? God produces the hunger. 
I think others of us can become immensely discouraged by apparent setbacks and body blows on the macro scale. I mean, what must it have been like for those disciples as they were driven out and away from this hugely exciting gospel advance going on in Jerusalem and now through persecution driven out? But God is at work overseeing the unstoppable advance of his gospel. I think here in England, where probably the hardest people to reach with the gospel are the white Anglo-Saxon middle classes. No more tough people group than the Anglo-Saxon middle classes. And it's easy for us to feel despondent and to forget that across the world, the gospel is advancing at extraordinary pace. Africa, China... And that when they closed down the Soviet Union to the gospel and banned the Bible, the moment the Soviet Union crumbled, there was massive gospel advance across the Soviet Union. God is behind it. He moves as he wishes. He summons whom he wants. He drives his mission. And it may just be that you are here this afternoon by divine appointment. Not quite sure why you got here, how you got here. You didn't come here on an Oxbourne cart, maybe. You certainly won't get here by tube tomorrow. But somebody brought you and something in you said, well, I better go and find this out. Well, this may just be God's divine appointment for you as he moves his mission forward. But then we see that Jesus and his death and resurrection is at the center of it. And I want us to turn now from the broad analysis of what's going on in 26 to 31 to a more detailed, in-depth look at two verses at the heart of the passage. You can see them in 32 and 33 on page 1105. These two verses take us to the heart of the message, and I take it that this individual encounter is placed here by Dr. Luke so that we realize what it is these disciples were saying as they were scattered abroad through persecution to those whom they met. The Ethiopian's daily reading was from the prophet Isaiah and he got to chapter 53. It was clearly a long journey. The two verses Philip hears contain both a pearl and a puzzle. The pearl is verse 32. This is a quote from Isaiah 53. Alec Mateer has written the magisterial work on on Isaiah, and he calls chapter 53, he says this, the towering theological genius of Isaiah is nowhere more apparent than in this chapter. As our friend went up to the temple, he would have seen numerous animals sacrificed. The purpose of the sacrificial animal was symbolically to carry God's judgment in my place such that I could have access to an open relationship with God without fear of his anger and just judgment. Let me say that again in case you weren't concentrating. The purpose of the sacrificial animal was symbolically to carry God's judgment in my place such that I, with God's judgment now on this animal, could have access to an open relationship with God without fear and judgment. And this all took place at the temple No animal, however, could ever satisfactorily carry God's judgment at my sinful heart. After all, an animal went to its death only with blind compliance. It was an animal. It was forced. No animal could do more than merely picture substitution. It's not human. The animal then goes with blind compliance. But the prophet Isaiah spoke of a day when a servant of God would come as God and go willingly to his death as a sacrificial lamb in order to carry God's just judgment at your sin and mine. Just glance at verse 32. Like a sheep... 
He, this servant, was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. So that this servant, fully human, was to do what no human had ever done before, to live a perfect life, to submit absolutely to the will of God, to go to the place of sacrifice, fully human, perfectly divine, carrying God's just judgment at our human sin. Here then is the pearl of these verses. As the Ethiopian is reading from Isaiah, and he gets to this passage in chapter 53, and he reads of this servant who would be led like a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb to the sacrifice, to carry God's just judgment at human sin. Not surprising then that the Ethiopian asks the question he asks in verse 34, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about somebody else? And Philip is ready with his answer. He opened his mouth and he spoke about Jesus. Who then went to Jerusalem willingly and selflessly, humbly and obediently? Jesus. Who is it that has died sacrificially as a perfect, obedient substitute for the sins of humanity? Jesus. Who is this divine being who can satisfactorily achieve what thousands of sacrifices over centuries has failed to achieve? Jesus. Who is it that carries God's just judgment at your sins and mine? Jesus. Jesus Christ then has done everything that the temple pointed to. There is the pearl. The puzzle is there in verse 33. Verse 33 could refer to Isaiah 53 verse 8, which talks about the generation of the suffering servant who unjustly committed him to his death. Who can describe his generation? They killed the Lord's king. Look at the wickedness of it. They rejected Jesus. But Acts chapter 8 verse 33 is not a perfect word-for-word -word translation of Isaiah 53. It is rather something of a summary of the last part of Isaiah 53 which speaks of the results of G the servant's death. That the servant's sacrificial death on behalf of the sinner will be vindicated by God, accepted by God, and that God would raise this servant up to life and make him the head of a vast number of men and women belonging to God. Personally, I think that is most likely. Who can number the vast swarms of the servant's generation gathered from the ends of the earth? Who can number his children? They're like the stars in the sky. They're like the dust of the earth. They're like the sand on the seashore. They can never be counted. And this fits perfectly with our Ethiopian friend. He'd gone up to Jerusalem for a religious festival. As a eunuch, he was not allowed into the temple. He was considered to be impure. As a foreigner, he was not allowed into the inner courts. And so his visit to the temple was both inspiration and profound anticlimax. Because he's journeyed all the way up to Jerusalem. This is the high moment of his life. He gets to the temple and he discovers that at the outer courts of the Gentiles has a great wall around it, chest high, and posted on the wall in Latin and Greek, no man of another race is to enter within the fence and enclosure. Whoever is caught will only have himself to thank for the death that follows. A huge sign, keep out. And therefore every visit 
for this Ethiopian was a reminder that he was not, nor ever could be, a full member, a, 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 a real insider in, amongst God's people. And surely that's why he asks the question in verse 34, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about somebody else? Show me the man. Who is it that's going to die on my behalf? A perfect sacrificial death to take away my sin, which is so profound, and enable me to be included. Who is it whose perfect sacrificial death Life is now approved by God. Death is approved by God and who is lifted up from the earth and enthroned in heaven so that he can call a sinner like you and like me to himself. Who is this? And that makes sense of the question too in verse 36. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? What prevents even me? I could be fully included. And that makes sense of verse 39, 26 at the beginning of the passage as we find Philip going south away from the temple. So what we're being shown in these chapters is the Samaritans receiving the gospel with joy, the Ethiopian receiving the gospel with joy, people of different race, a black African, a mixed race Samaritan, people of different religion, a Jewish proselyte, serious enough to go on pilgrimage, a part Jew, part Gentile, superstitious pagan Samaritan of different rank, one of the highest rated officials in the court of Queen Candace, and on the other hand, rural villagers from across the region of Samaria. Here we have people from every race, every rank, every religion, and none coming to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. And the heart of the message that they're hearing is this truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sin. And that Jesus Christ has been exalted to heaven by God. And that as you or I put our trust in Jesus, whoever we are, whatever our past, we are accepted and fully included amongst the people of God. God is behind it. You'll never stop it. Jesus Christ is at the center of it. If you want to know if an authentic Christian work is going on, here is the plumb line. Is the death and resurrection of Jesus right at the heart of it? And finally, very briefly, verbal explanation is essential to it. If we had longer, we could go through the whole chapter and see this again and again and again. Verse 4, they went about preaching. Verse 5, they went to the city of Samaria and proclaimed. Verse 12, they believed Philip as he preached. Verse 25, they returned to Jerusalem preaching. Verse 35, he told them, literally he preached to them the good news about Jesus. Verse 40, he preached the gospel to all the towns. Different words for preaching, proclamation, explanation, but all verbal Different settings, a mass group uh, in one setting, in the center town of Samaria, little villages, small groups, and here on the road to Emmaus, uh, on the road to south um, down to Gaza, one on one, just the two of them in the chariot. Explanation is central to it. Notice verse 31. How can I understand unless someone guides me? And notice verse 35. Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he literally evangelized him with Jesus. There is a form of almost mystical Christianity that thinks, providing I just show someone some love, then they're bound to become a Christian. 
which fundamentally denies the teaching of this chapter. You find it in things like Love, London. Go, go and wash everybody's cars or go and clean up the litter or something like that, which is a wonderful thing to do. But unless there is verbal explanation of the gospel, it is not authentic Christian mission. Philip did not get out his chamois leather and start washing down the ox cart. He went to the scriptures and explained them. In our circles, there's another form of almost mystical Christianity. Just give them a gospel and let them get on with it. Look again at verse 31. How can I unless someone guides me? It seems then that we're learning in this chapter that alongside the word, we need somebody to help us to understand it. We need somebody to make sense of it. We need somebody to explain it. Let's pray together. Forgive us, our Father in heaven, where we have thought it all depends upon us. Grant us the humility to look to you. We pray that you would work here in the city in power and bring many to the point of this Ethiopian. Forgive us where we have drifted from the heart of the message, Jesus Christ crucified and risen, and grant us courage, and enable us, our Father in heaven, please, to be those who explain the word, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.